And as long as we have racism in this world, you're never going to have peace. Obviously, the world is not perfect today, um, but I think we're very pleased at what's happened at least in the 30 years since uh, this uh, event at the Woolworth store. I Obviously, feel that, um, well, things are getting better, but like with the situation over at Page, I think that things still need to be done. Um, people. I think there's still people that are prejudiced towards blacks and towards people. I think we've made a lot of progress, but I think we've got a long way to go. Race relations, I, I don't know, that's a tough question. I, uh, if, if you mean how do I feel about how people treat each other, I think all over the world there's some indications of some very good race relations and some indications of some very poor race relations. So as it relates to this uh, uh, what we're celebrating today well, everything here. Everything has just completely turned around. We have the integrated schools, we have integrated churches, we have integrated in just about anything you go at. Uh, you can see the racism in their faces uh, when they, they've already been taken to the woodshed and told the difference between being white and black in the system. They were turned their back. Well, I think that there are they're not as bad as it used to be, but I feel that there's still racial problems. It's just more subtle now. More than 30 years ago, four students from the all-black agricultural and technical college sat down at the Woolworth lunch counter in downtown Greensboro. They asked for the same service that was given to white customers. That simple act initiated a protest movement that spread throughout the country, and the A&T students were joined by more idealistic young people who wanted to confront racism with the American democratic ethic. In 1980 and again in 1990, the city of Greensboro commemorated the sit-ins and the goals of equality those students hoped to achieve. The anniversaries are a reminder that the histories we celebrate are part of a continuing struggle. There are many provocative stories told by people who witnessed or took part in the historic event. Some of these stories are told by women who were then students at the Women's College, now called the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. It was unexpected that women from the prestigious, predominantly white women's school would support the movement. Rose has a little story, the kind that is often forgotten among the more clamorous events that shape history. Marilyn Lott and Jeannie Siemens um, and although we weren't roommates we were friends and I think that from February 1st on uh, everybody's adrenaline who cared one way or the other and I must tell you that it was one way or the other um, had really been up and that was the topic of conversation and I think we finally must have said to ourselves um, let's go be heard um, again, rather naively and not dreaming of the ramifications, it just seemed the logical thing to do. I believe it was fairly early afternoon, um, and we did indeed wear class jackets, which was later to become quite a point of contention, an excuse for some later actions, uh, because we were very highly visible in our WC jackets, very proud of them, black with the white insignia on the pocket. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, it was a rather gloomy and overcast day, and we didn't have cars, because students didn't have cars 30 years ago, and so we simply walked in uh, from, I remember starting out from the corner and going on uh, down to Main Street uh, in downtown Greensboro, not a, not a long walk. We arrived at the Woolworths, and there were a large number of people who were really very agitated already. And almost everybody in the store was white, and really um, pretty rough trade in, for, 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 in most circumstances. 
uh, certainly not what we sheltered college girls were used to. And we literally elbowed our way up through the front of this very long store with crowded display areas, fairly narrow aisles, got up to the very front of the um, store, and there was the lunch counter. And of course, as soon as we arrived, uh, these three rather hefty fellows, um, sort of redneck-looking fellows, if I can be categorizing so many years later, immediately gave us, our, gave us their seats and were absolutely astounded when the waitress came up to us and said, uh, what would you like to order? And we said, I believe there are some people here ahead of us. And when I was asked about service, I would always say, well, these, these people were here before I was. And I went there with a sense of the need to fulfill a moral obligation uh, and express my, my religious and ethical beliefs. The lunch counter was at the back of the store, the dime store. And when we went in, you, you could see what the, the system was. It was easy to see how it worked. There were townspeople and black students at the lunch counter. And as one townsperson finished eating, somebody would slip onto the stool and then wait to be served. And the thing is that as, as white people, somebody who was stubbornly hanging onto a stool so as not to let a black person get on it was certainly going to yield his seat to a white girl. Well, I'm sure we had some conversation, and one of the things that I did was make a whole series of sketches, which have been printed since that time in conjunction with some articles about this experience. Um, I think that pretty much we were just trying to assess what we'd gotten ourselves into. We had people around us pressing against us, touching us, who were very upset with us. Um, a man in back of me had a knife which he never used on me, but which he had held up against me. Um, and I think that as the time went on, uh, most of our thoughts were pretty much, how are we going to get out of here? Because we had a lot of Woolworth store to back out of to get to the sidewalk, and we had a long walk home. And it suddenly struck us that maybe we had somewhat of a problem here. Just the townspeople themselves were very hostile, not only about the black students and the sit-in, but that white people would ally themselves with such behavior. And quite truthfully, because of the way I was raised, there was no question that I was in support of what was going on. Um, but they, we did come out in a group with a lot of students around us. And it was, for, it was for the safety of everybody who was at the lunch counter, because you couldn't really be sure of what was going to happen. Five o'clock came. The dilemma was obviously part of the conversation of the A&T students there. And they had come up with this absolutely incredible solution, which was to put Jeannie and Marilyn and myself inside of a linked arm circle and to move shoulder to shoulder with us in the middle through those Woolworth aisles being threatened and spit upon and cursed at the whole way to get to the sidewalk and to hail a, ca to hail a cab. And while we were waiting for a cab, Everybody there stood still and said the Lord's Prayer with us in the middle, which was certainly one of the most extraordinary and moving moments of my whole life. And when the cab pulled up, I'm sure the cab driver was very surprised at what was going on. The back door was opened, and the three of us were put inside, and we just shot away. And as I say, it was a couple of miles from downtown up to the campus. And we arrived in... Uh, to a flurried kind of reception because the word was already out and students at that time were 
very divided. You were either very pro for what was going on or you were very con. Uh, my southern girls' school at the time, um, tongues were wagging. And uh, my first phone call was uh, from the dean of women at the time, who promptly informed all of us that we were no longer students there. <laughs> and the jackets came up as an issue. We had been too highly visible. I didn't leave school. Um, my parents were living in London at the time. And they knew about what was happening very, very quickly, because that episode made headlines. And they picked up the newspaper in London, and there was a half-page picture of um, their baby daughter on the front page of the London newspaper. And when I was told I was no longer welcome at the university, I had called my father, and he sent a telegram to the dean and in total support of me and the situation and the position that I had taken. No questions asked. I've always just loved my daddy for that, yeah. uh, saying, I trust your judgment on that. And that must have given some rethinking time. And uh, we, were not, we were not dismissed at that point. But life changed considerably. Uh, my um, first reaction was that when, when we learned that there were uh, women's college students, was whether or not there were some of the black students. Uh, and then when it was known that there, there were not black students, but that the, there were three um, uh, of the white students on campus, uh, a feeling of, of um, real um, pride that they had been courageous and brave enough uh, to take that kind of uh, action uh, on behalf of, of black students or on black people, because at the time that was a very, very courageous uh, kind of thing to do. Uh, and while I did not know two of those students, I did know one of the students, um, Ann Deersley, who was, a, um, I believe, a senior at the time, as was I. And um, while I did not know her uh, extremely well, I did know her, and, and uh, our paths crossed occasionally on campus. So uh, I felt very, very proud that they had uh, done this, and I was, you know, pleased that they would have taken that kind of action. A little bit frightened for them, because yeah. I, you know, scared for them, because I didn't know what the re repercussions would be. We did not accept any telephone calls without being monitored for the rest of that school year because there were so many threatening phone calls. The FBI monitored our mail for a while. I did not go off campus, and neither did Jeannie or Marilyn go off campus for the rest of the uh, semester, which was the end of the academic year. There was no question but that participation by our three white women students with the black male A&T students that greatly increased the inflammatory nature of the situation among the large redneck element in the community. The following week, I spoke to the women's college students at convocation. Among other things, I said, quote, it should be clear that in this college, there should never be any effort to tell you what stands you should take on controversial issues or how you should assert your inalienable rights as individuals and citizens. I went on to urge our students, quote, to weigh carefully the probable consequences of any action that you may contemplate. It is only in an atmosphere free from pressure and emotionalism that a fair and just solution may be found." End quote. In the senior class, there were two students, myself and, and one other student, Betty Ann Davis Tillman. Uh, in the junior class, there were three uh, black students, two of whom lived on campus, and the third student who lived in the uh, community of Greensboro. She was what we call a town student. I don't know what, what you all uh, call the students who commute back and forth today. Um, that student who lived in the community um, and who commuted back and forth to campus actually participated 
in the the sit-in movement uh, or the sit-ins at, at the um, at the Woolworth uh, lunch counter. She um, uh, worked at uh, A and T State University. She um, was a, a a student who who also worked. She uh, knew at least two of the young men who partic who participated in the sit uh, sit-ins. They were called sit-downs at the time. So I'm I'm having some difficulty with you know <laughs> um, with my terminology here. Um, but at any rate. Um, she, she said to us that um, she had learned that the administration was um, very opposed to the participation of any student in, uh, in the sit-ins. And we were aware of it. I don't recall being called in by the chancellor or the dean of students or a house council or anyone like that. It was, it was simply something that that was um, uh, talked about uh, it was in the air you know people were aware that the three girls who had actually gone down um, and who had participated were told that they were not supposed to do that and that um, the administration was very much opposed to so we were aware that you know that was something that was completely taboo and that was not to be done and um, uh, Claudette indicated that uh, she, the dean, had called her in and said that she was not, not to be participate. Well, let me see what I can remember. I think the, um, I, you know, I think students were, were very much afraid. You know, I, I can remember being very afraid that something was going to happen because you did have all, you know, you not only had the students, but you had the hecklers and the people who were saying ugly things to you. You knew that, um, as related to Woolworths, you weren't wanted there, and it's almost like, you know, why are you here? And and um, I can remember um, um, all kinds of ugly comments, you know, and all kinds of name calling and and uh, threats, and um, so it was almost like um, um, the atmosphere was one of fear, uh, and and you sort of gain support from each other because you know if. if if everybody else was going to take the risk to sit there or to be there, then you, um, you know, sort of felt very supported by that, and um, um, and really felt like you were making, you know, making some progress uh, when it continued day after day. You know, well, not progress in the sense of of the fact that you were getting more determined to do what you know you planned to do. But I remember just being frightened that something was going to happen to somebody, that we weren't going to be able to maintain our cool, and that um, our quote adults were just going to make us stop because I think school officials um, were making an effort to be supportive. People that we had looked to in the community were sort of riding the fence. You know, you didn't know whether they were with you or not with you. And, and there was this, at, at points, you felt like it was truly a student movement. You didn't know what the adults would do. Um, and certainly, um, I don't think Women's College expected any of their students to be involved. And when they were, and when they found out they were, then of, of course all of the negative reaction came, as I recall it, you know, because they did not want us there. Um, um, I wasn't noticed so much, because it, certainly I was black, and you didn't know whether I was at A&T or Bennett or at uh, Women's College with the exception of, of my jacket. And I don't recall wearing that the second day. I don't know. I do recall something about the jacket the third day or fourth day because it, it, we were told not to wear them. That if we were to participate in the you know, demonstrations, do not put on the jacket or indicate the college in any way. Well, she may not have been uh, as identifiable as a woman's college student because she was black. It was certainly very obvious that the other three students uh, who were white who participated were easily identified as, um, as students from the woman's college campus. Um, at the time we were there, uh, one, of, one, of, one of the students' proudest possessions was uh, her jacket. 
and it, each each class had a, a different colored jacket, and it had um, uh, the woman's college insignia on it. And we wore those jackets practically everywhere. I believe it was the case with the three young ladies who uh, who went down that they probably had on their their class jacket. I think when I got there, they were there. Because when I when I came back through downtown and stopped to see what was going on and because I had to go to work and um, I felt really good that and then I wasn't sure at that point except for the jackets when I did see one of the school jackets and I'm sure you know that our history of jackets are very much part of, of who we are at Women's College but uh, who we were at Women's College but um, then I knew that they were you know Women's College students and I felt very good about that. The idea that this brief experience was so special and so extraordinary and is so vivid in my mind 30 years later, I think is a result of feeling that um, no matter how naively we undertook to go down and make this statement, it turned into really a spiritual voyage. Um, the voyage occurred perhaps after the action. Um, it certainly was obvious from the very beginning sitting at that lunch counter that we, had n we were not in the middle of an ordinary situation, that the air was crackling, there was electricity in the air. And when we walked through those Woolworth counters and stood on the sidewalk and the Lord's Prayer was in the air all around me, that was a spiritual experience, um, one that I don't think I've ever had another spiritual experience like that. I don't think the Lord's Prayer has ever meant as much as it did on that afternoon. A lot of things have changed since Anne, Jeannie, Marilyn, and Claudette first walked into Woolworths over 30 years ago. But there's still a long way to go. After all, change doesn't only take place in the rule books, but in the hearts and minds of people. And that type of change often takes longer. We can always work for reform and hope for it, though. Some of the greatest expressions of hope were the words that rang out on August 28, 1963, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. told America that he had a dream. And we have a dream also. That one day we will be rather than to seem. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk to work. 